he did yesterday. But I mean, uh, just to mention for those in the audience which come from Brazil and speak Portuguese, that two of his books have been translated into Portuguese. I think those are the two books, Antoine. I don't know if I did any mistake. Uh, so is that just to tell you that? Okay, uh, after what I said yesterday about the importance of Swiss prod, I couldn't do less than accept when uh, Amos asked me to try to fill in a gap. However, of course, uh, this is a uh, complete improvisation with the, well, the material ha I, I had at my disposal, so I hope you will forgive me if it's a bit awkward. So, what about, uh, wh why this organism? Pseudo uh, Alteromonas haloplanctis has been isolated from Antarctica by a group of Belgian scientists. And why were we interested in that? The reason is fairly simple, in fact. Uh, as you probably know, despite global warming, uh, more than 90% of the Earth's surface is below 15 degrees Celsius. And the structure of water is, of course, extremely important for life, uh, especially below 12 degrees. A lot of things happen that will constrain very much the structures of macromolecules, structure of membranes, and so on. So uh, it, it's a bit of a puzzle for me that high temperature ha has raised a lot of interest, but not, not so much low temperature. So we wanted to look at a, an organism which grows very fast under cold conditions, and this organism goes... Uh, Grows at, has a doubling time of about, uh, say, five to six hours at uh, zero degrees Celsius, which is extremely fast. If you have it in the cold room, well, you have it growing. And the uh, growth yield, because of the uh, solution of dioxygen at low temperature, the growth yield is extremely high. So this is an interesting uh, place where you can compare uh, what happens to an organism when the temperature is very low. So this work was in collaboration with the Genoscope, and in particular with uh, Claudine Medy. And uh, in fact, if you are interested in the, in the organism, uh, I think that tomorrow uh, Claudine will have a tutorial on uh, her platform, Maj, and maybe you could uh, plug into uh, the uh, uh, Pseudo-Alteromonas Haloplanctis uh, the database there and see what happens with that if you have uh, further questions. So also, there is something amusing, if I can say so. Uh, Gunnar von Heine could not come today. Uh, unfortunately, I hope he will recover soon. And he also participated in, in, in this work. So let, let's go back to uh, the reason why we are interested in, 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 uh, in, in, in bacterial genomes. And one thing which I think is most fascinating and is still true uh, when, in 1991, the first chromosome of yeast was presented together with 100 kilobases of Bacillus subtilis, it was very surprising that uh, this was continuous pieces of DNA which were sequenced, and half, or at that time it was more than half of the genes, uh, didn't look like anything known, whether in structure or in function. And this, this was a real puzzle because at that time it was predicted and in fact maybe now it's so fashionable to, to do genome sequences that you may not remember that there was a huge fight against sequencing saying that this would divert most of the resources of science and so on uh, uh, against that and the, the main reason was that if you took one mutant for any organism isolated the gene corresponding to the mutant and then sequenced the gene, you would find that this, the gene product would look like, well, have 95% of chances to look like something known. So this, the, the adversaries of the program said, we know already almost everything, so why sequence genomes? You know? And so this was a really, I think, very important discovery. And there was a second thing, which is that uh, some of the genes uh, where uh, are still, each time you sequence a new genome, uh, are still completely foreign. They do not look like anything known, and they are called orphan 
uh, proteins, orphan genes and orphan proteins, and I will say a few words about that in a moment. So if I look carefully yesterday, uh, at the moment there are something like 2,000 uh, ongoing or finished genome programs, which is a fairly large number, and uh, I think this is a late figure. I think we uh, at the EBI we have no, now more than 145 billion nucleotides. And I think that uh, 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 during this, this, the first presentation, this meeting, most of what was said was about higher organisms. And I think we should remember that at least 50% of the Earth's protoplasm, that is, I, I, I do not consider cellulose or lignin, which is, of course, very important in mass, 50% of the Earth's protoplasm is made of microbes, mostly bacteria and archaea. And I think this is a huge resource in genes which, and in the history of evolution and so on, so we should not despise microbes. So <laughs> I think this is still very, very uh, interesting to, to, to study. And uh, we still find that, well, depending on the genome, 50 to f uh, 40 to 50 percent of genes do not look like anything known. And maybe you saw that extraordinary thing which has been discovered recently by the group of Sidney Kustu uh, in Esha Esha Koli. Uh, he found an entirely new pathway for degradation of pyrimidines. Two, two, two pathways were already known, and this new one, which means several genes together, uh, is absolutely specific to the Ishesha coli species. So this shows you that metabolic pathway can happen somewhere. You don't know where they come from, and I think this is a very interesting puzzle. And finally, uh, only 10% of the gene correspond to the core genome uh, sequence, the persistent gene I was uh, speaking about yesterday. So, uh, here I, I want to uh, emphasize one point about the way we do inductive re reasoning to uh, identify functions. We try to uh, study the neighborhoods, and I, I will sh show you one type of neighborhood in the proteome of uh, Pseudoalteromonas aloplanctis, and you will see that this tells us quite interesting things. And another point which I think is very important to uh, emphasize is that regulation evolves much faster than any structural uh, gene, and this uh, should be borne in mind when you compare organisms. And once again, at the moment, uh, we uh, belong to a program which analyzes many E. coli genomes, and there are extraordinary things which are extraordinary regulations which are completely specific to E. coli and are not present in other enterobacteria, for example. So this is one point which is, uh, for example, for industry, animal models are certainly misleading when you consider humans. So, uh, the neighborhood we consider now is the, uh, uh, what happens in gro for growth in the cold, and I will consider, because we speak about Swiss prot, mostly the, uh, the proteome. But before I do that, uh, I remind you the challenge posed by uh, cold. So, one is, of course, everything linked to the structure of water, protein folding, RNA folding, and the, this is a very challenging problem as uh, the importance of RNA is increasing uh, these days, in including in bacteria. Uh, and of course, membrane fluidity. And one thing which we need to consider is the fact that gases and radicals, radicals are more stable and gases are more soluble at low temperature. So oxygen poses very strong uh, problems. So the, uh, the way this organism cope with cold uh, led us to find a series of uh, unexpected answers, and I will mostly discuss this. So let's study the first, the genome organi organization of the uh, organism. It has two chromosomes. Uh, this is very similar to what you find in Vibrios, for example. But there is one thing which is uh, amusing. Uh, I think, to my knowledge, this is the, the first case where you find that. The second chromosome, and you see it very well uh, when you analyze the GCQ. Unfortunately, I couldn't have uh, with me the, uh, the uh, figures to show you that. The GCQ shows that the replication is unidirectional. So this is clearly 
a, pla a megaplasmid. But this is also a chromosome because it has the whole metabolism of histidine and histidine tRNA synthetase plus several uh, other essential genes. So this is one case where you see two chromosomes, including one, which is a plasmid recruited as a true chromosome. So I think this is probably the, the only example because in Vibrios, the second chromosome is bidirectional in, in replication. This one is unidirectional. So let's uh, use the one of the methods which was described yesterday about multivariate uh, analysis, correspondence analysis. We wondered uh, about the, the way amino acids would be distributed in proteins. So, so the, uh, the idea is very simple. You take all the proteins in a, making a proteome, and you place the proteins inside uh, the amino acid space, and you see how this distributes. And we were very much puzzled by what the observation we made. This is a work by Geraldine Pascal, working with uh, Claudine Meding and myself. And we were very much puzzled because there were clearly two different uh, uh, clusters of, uh, of proteins. And in fact, we could reproduce this with all prokaryotes we analyzed. And to make a long story short, we can show that this cloud of point uh, is made of truly integral inner membrane proteins. And in fact, this method, uh, correspondence analysis in this case, can be used to predict with, I would say, something like 98% accuracy uh, whether a protein is uh, <laughs> uh, integral in, 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 inner integral membrane protein, and this, this is, looks fairly strange because this property derives only from the amino acid composition, which is quite simple. Now, correspondence analysis, in contrast to principal component analysis, you could say that correspondence analysis is one kind of PCA with a special measure. And the special measure is chi square. Now, if you do that, it has the it, it allows you to put on the same figure the proteins in the space of amino acids or the amino acids in the space of proteins. So this is very nice because this allows you to, to show, and here this is what we did, to show that what, what are the driving forces which organize the clouds of points. And here, if you look for the first three axes which organize the clouds of points, you find one which is mainly driven by hydrophobicity, so you see here uh, the hydrophobic amino acids and here charge amino acid. A second one, which is driven by aromaticity, and I will go back in a, in a moment to that. And a third one, which is driven by something which I think is, uh, maybe st structuralists will be able to say something to me, which is driven by the GC content of the organism, but not the GC content at the second position of the codon but the GC content at the first position of the corner. So it means that you can separate amino acid. There are some properties which separate amino acid according to the GC content of the first cordon position. So to summarize, so you have the first axis which allows you to separate between integral inner membrane proteins, and this can be used as a, as a general method to pre predict these proteins. Second axis, or third axis, depending on the organism, which separate between uh, the proteins with the, according to the GC content of the first codon position, and a third one axis, which is driven by aromatic amino acids. Now, if you compare many, many different organisms, you find that there are usually four axes which are important. A uh, 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 fourth one I will speak about in a moment, uh, and the order of the different axes, ex uh, axes except for the f first one, uh, may change, of course, but roughly speaking, the strange thing is that if you take many different organisms with, with quite different GC content and so on, these, these are always the axes which organize the proteome. Now, is this linked to the functions? You, you, you see here that this is, something is linked to the function because you can separate the membrane protein first, but there is more than that. And so we wanted to see what happens in, 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 the, in the case of pseudo uh, Alteromonas haloplanctis. And we put together organisms which were thermophilic organisms, mesophilic organisms, and psychophilic organisms. And there we put 
the, all these organisms together, and you find again, so now you, you, this is a mixture of different proteomes, okay? You still find that the uh, integral inner membrane proteins can be completely separated. So this is really a very strong thing. Now you find also that there is a difference between mesophiles and psychophiles, and of course the thermophiles are also uh, highly separated. So there are different constraints in the proteome depending on the temperature of growth of the organism. And the driving force which separates between the mesophiles and the uh, psychophiles is a bias you can see here between asparagine and cysteine. Now, the main contribution is from asparagine because it's not rare amino acid. The contribution of cysteine, statistically speaking, is not so important because there are much less cysteines in, in the organism. So if you take the, the importance of the contribution, this is mostly driven by asparagine. So this led us to think that there is something in, interesting to see in uh, uh, about asparagine. At that time, I was, wasn't completely aware of the different properties of different amino acids in, in proteins. By the, by the way, I have a question for structuralists. Can anybody answer that question? Why is tyrosine the less soluble amino acid? Tyrosine is much less soluble than phenylalanine. I would very much like to know the answer, if the answer is no. Now, so why asparagine? Well, if you look, uh, and, and I'm quite puzzled by that because it's, there is not much literature on the subject, and, and only a few groups work on that. Asparagine, in fact, drives the maj the, the, the maj uh, one of the major post-translational modifications. In fact, asparagine cyclizes itself, I will show you how in a moment, in a reaction which is poorly understood, that is, the context is not really understood, and of course we don't know how much it's programmed. If you look into the proteins of E. coli, after 10 hours, uh, you leave the E. coli uh, bacteria on the plate for 10 hours. After 10 hours, more than 30% of the aspartates and asparagines have isomerized. And at least in one uh, ribosomal protein, the isomerization of the aspartate is within two minutes. So you cannot think it's not functional. Because, because the ribosomes stay there, so the isomerization is present there. This, of course, affects both structure and maybe function of the protein. This interferes with folding. And, of course, in many cases, it's a signal for protein degradation. So it has not... Well, I think this is one of the things which should be studied more experimentally. So the way it works is the following. You have asparagine in, 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 in the, uh, alpha, the, in, in the uh, carbon backbone. And you have a slow isomerization, and what happens is that uh, it can go, especially with asparagine, but this can happen also with the aspartate. It goes to aspartate and isoaspartate. In many organisms, in, including E. coli and humans, but not in B. subtilis, you have a system to correct that. You can methylate, and this is very expensive in terms of energy, you can methylate isoaspartate, and this will reverse the reaction which go there and have one chance in two to go here or back again here. So it's very costly to correct proteins. So there is a proofreading system to do that. And people in industry know this phenomenon very well because this is the basis of deamidation of proteins which are produced in many organisms. And now this makes quite interesting the organism growing at low, very low temperature because as I saw you, as I show, showed you, the, the bias in asparagine means that they can accommodate many more asparagines than uh, mesophilic or thermophilic organisms. So it means that if you want to express foreign proteins, maybe it would be interesting to do that in, um, in those types of bacteria. Now, what about the other universal bias we found, which is driven by aromatic amino acids? If you go back to the uh, structure of the cloud of points, we could analyze the genes on each side of, of, of the uh, axis driven by uh, aromaticity. So if you look for proteins which are highly aromatic, you find, and this is very curious, that at least 50%, and this is true in all organisms, at least 50% are labeled orphan proteins. 
In contrast, where you find less aromatics, you find ribo ribosomal proteins, for example, and proteins which are expressed at a very high level. So there is something linked to, um, to aromatics. And here I looked into a lot of uh, papers on, on structural biology, and I discovered something I was not at all aware of, so maybe this is wrong, what I will say. Uh, I discovered that apparently the aromatics, instead of piling up like bases in DNA, they make orthogonal uh, in interactions. But they, in they are prone to interact. So what we propose is that at least some of these, these proteins will be what we call gluons. That is, if you create a new, a new protein in an organism, and if this protein can glue together proteins which are better together to channel metabolites or to make complexes and so on, they uh, will provide to the organism some kind of uh, increased fitness. Okay, So that might be a way you recruit them, and they, this would be done by using aromatics in, in some cases. So you would postulate that this protein would be small, and this is indeed what we find, very rich on, in aromatics, and they will interact with some aromatics which are present in larger proteins making complexes. And then, of course, because uh, synthesis of aromatics is extremely expensive, you know that uh, in particular through the work of uh, Takashi Gojobori, who made a long analysis of the uh, metabolic costs uh, of amino acids, uh, evolution will slowly probably replace these type of interactions with something for maybe ionic interaction or other types of interaction, and then the proteins will disappear from the orphan class and belong to a more standard class. So this is just one, uh, one hypothesis, but I think it may be interesting to explore. So uh, also another question to structuralists, do we have a 3D structure of complexes where some subunits have no function, no known function. I would very much like to well, know what, what kind of composition they have. <laughs> okay. And uh, finally, the, the question is the, uh, what happens to their resistance to oxygen? And we were very puzzled by uh, what we observed. Uh, the, f uh, the first thing is that there is concerted deletion of a whole metabolism, which is the metabolism of molybdopterin. You find all the enzymes uh, used to make molybdopterin, and all the enzymes using molybdopterin have disappeared in a concerted way. And this is something we found more and more when we looked into comparison of many genomes. When you have a pathway uh, made of several paths, even when the paths are spread throughout the genome, they disappear or appear in a concerted way. Usually, they appear as one piece, and then this, uh, through evolution, this piece is split through the genome in uh, other places, and then it disappears in a concerted way. So as if there was a mechanism to know what a gene is that is uh, not going through the gene and delete the genes. And the second thing we found, so this is a way to protect the bacteria against oxygen, because molybdopterin produces a lot of reactive oxygen species, the reaction using this coenzyme. And also we found that in, in the organism there are many dioxygenases, many more than elsewhere, so th this you can understand. And that was something which we found very uh, fascinating, in fact. It's a kind of uh, hi hitchhiking or coincidence. One of the ways to increase membrane fluidity is to go from saturated lipids to unsaturated lipids. And in order to do so, the uh, bacteria use a dioxygenase, which consumes dioxygen. So when you lower the temperature, you do both at, at the same time, you increase fluidity of the membrane and destroy oxygen. And I think this is really a fascinating thing. So this will be the end of my story, a bit short, but okay. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Dr. Donchon? Uh, 
Uh, we ha can we have a microphone over here? Hello, thank you for this interesting talk. I have just a question about the gluons where you put actually the aromatic residues in the outside. I would have expected that they would be in the inside and therefore unable to form these uh, things. Well, this is exactly one of the questions why I asked uh, about tyrosine. Uh, are, where, where are the tyrosines and, and uh, how are isolated tyrosine in, in, in general? Uh, I am quite interested in that because uh, I, I don't understand why tyrosine is so insoluble. So, uh, of course, this is just a drawing. It could be you can you can put it in any type of interaction, it's folding. What? Well, here I just had a remark uh, from my neighbor. That actually, dityrosine is not uncommon. So the pKa is not that low that uh, it wouldn't uh, oxidize that. Uh, diff I mean, it was oxidized quite easily, and therefore you would end up with um, two aromatic rings rather than one if you have dityrosine. Okay, then, so um, well, you have to draw me the, uh, the picture. <laughs> I need to see how it works because uh, you would expect, because uh, well, spontaneously there is an one OH that it would be more soluble than phenylalanine. I think so. Well. So this is a question of interaction with water. It, 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 and the difference in solubility is enormous. This is a, hello? 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 This is a, a comment. This is a comment on um, your question about uh, amino acid composition. There's a class of proteins that are not often discussed called intrinsically disordered proteins whose uh, function is really in question, but they're very much more frequent than eukaryotes. These proteins have a very um, very low content of hydrophobic amino acids and a rather high content of charged amino acids, but charged of one type, not of both types. And they may fit into this class of gluons in a different way than what you're describing here. We did not look at all in eukaryotes, so I cannot answer uh, to, to know whether the, a similar thing may happen. Actually, uh, when you begin to make clouds of proteins in, 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 in eukaryotes, you find that the structure is much more complex. And uh, actually, I think it's uh, very, very interesting. There are a lot of biases which suggest that s s the role of charge residues in eukaryotes maybe to buffer uh, protons inside the cell. And uh, I can e explain myself. The problem is that in eukaryotes you have mitochondria, but the mitochondria are inside the cells. Therefore, you need to cope with protons somehow. Now, if you, if you compute the number of protons inside the cell, you will see that you are facing very strange situations. Take E. coli. E. coli is 10 to the minus 15 liters. If it were at pH 7, this would mean 60 protons per cell. Usually pe people think that the, the internal pH, if there were a pH, would be 7.6, which would mean only 15 protons per cell. So I think this is a really serious problem which also should be addressed. There might be part of the function of the eukaryotic proteins, which is simply to carry a lot of protons for, for, for mitochondria. So this would, uh, this would have an effect, uh, an overall effect on, on the protein, I think, but, but I didn't look. So it's just, uh, just uh, uh, well, uh, how do you say pifometre? <laughs> I don't know. Well, you know what I mean. <laughs> just, just a question. On, uh, you, you have shown that there were classes of proteins with significantly different compositions. Now, we usually tend to, to generate substitution matrices with respect yeah. to, to the evolutionary distances, yeah. but I have never seen so strong effect when, when changing from, from blossom 60 to blossom 40. Do you think there will be a scope for generating substitution matrices? I, I, I think this would be very important. In fact, uh, I didn't have the material with me, so I couldn't elaborate on that. But if you look into the... Uh, the structure of the cloud of point, you find something which is absolutely fascinating. It is that uh, 
the overall composition of the proteins locally is linked to functions. So it, as if there was some kind of, and this is for me very difficult to understand, but of course this would have a role in evolution in, in, in the, as you say, substitution rates. And there is one thing which is, uh, well, the, the, the fourth axis of, uh, of biases is driven, in fact, in most organisms by lysine and asparagine together. This is very strange, except when you suddenly find that, oh, but this is strange, but this is the one, one box in, in, in the codon usage table. So why would be lysine and asparagine together? So I, I thought that over and over again because it, well, they do not look similar and usually people think, well, at least people like me, I don't say structuralists, uh, think that lysine are there to be charged. But of course, it could not be like that. It could also be because they are donating an, an, an uh, electron doublet. Now, if you look into the different amino acid contribution in, in the cell, you find that very often you, you, you have simply the same chemical uh, function more or less far from the backbone. So the, the difference, say, uh, between aspartate and glutamate or something like that is just to have the same function at different distances. So what would you do if you wanted to have a short lysine? Well, the short lysine would be ornithine. So, and indeed we make ornithine. So I wonder why don't we have ornithine in protein? The reason is very simple. And it's the same reason why we don't have uh, homocysteine and why we don't have homocysteine. And the reason for following, when they are activated by ATP on tRNA synthetases and go to tRNA, they cyclize immediately. So they make uh, homocysteine lactone or uh, homocysteine uh, thiolactone, and ornithine is also cyclizing. So this means that for purely chemical reasons, it, because you have the translation machinery, you cannot use some amino acids. So what would be a substitute for lysine? Well, maybe something not so good. It might be glutamine and asparagine. Uh, this is my, my explanation too. But I don't know whether this is. Once, uh, once again, something far-fetched. Thank you very much again, Antoine.